So before we get started, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about, about me, just to kind of let you know the perspective and the mindset that I have and where I, where I come from, why I have that mindset. Um, and I'll start with uh, kind of a personal note. So my wife, my wife is here with me, Frazian. And we, um, we've been married for over 30 years, but we have three children, and our youngest is, is special needs. He, he's diagnosed with uh, both intellectual and uh, some physical disabilities, and he's 22 years old. And from a parental perspective, you know, I've been in law enforcement. This is my 30th year in law enforcement. Um, and from a parental perspective, I know probably many of you who either have somebody in your family or one of your loved ones that you're close to, or many of you who have special needs in the audience, you know, me being in this line of work, one of the things that I think about often is what would happen if my son, if our son, came in contact with law enforcement? And how would he react if we're not around or his brothers and sisters or some other uh, person is not around to guide him through that, that encounter? And I, I do, and my wife as well, think about that quite often. You know, On the other side, from a professional perspective, it always crosses my mind about what can we do to get better? What can I do now, particularly now that I'm in this position? Uh, what can I personally do to make the situation better for others? And I think there's a lot of work to be done in this, in this regard. And I'm really happy and pleased that the San Francisco Police Department is taking steps in, those, in that direction to really make our interactions and our encounters with people and persons with uh, intellectual disabilities and uh, physical disabilities to make those encounters better. So <clears throat> that's going to be the focus of my presentation today. It's, it's, uh, it's a PowerPoint, but I will kind of interject. There's some videos that are here, and some of them are, are pretty, um, pretty intense, to say the least. But the reason I want to show those videos to you is because the issues that we're discussing are uh, issues that really can amount to life and death situations if we law enforcement, police officers, don't handle them properly. So as I said, there is a, a personal component to this for me. I'm personally vested in this. And the bottom line on the vision that you'll hear about shortly is you know, we want to get better and we want to be, we, the San Francisco Police Department, I think law enforcement in general, we want to do this right in terms of being able to deliver services to everybody that we come in contact, disabled or not. So that will be the focus of this presentation. So uh, disclosure, there's nothing for me to disclose really. I'm not being paid for this presentation. Uh, there's no fees attached to this. I'm doing it strictly because I want us to make a difference. So here's our overview. In the past few years, Spotlight has been basically on negative police encounters, particularly with persons in mental crisis and debilitating oftentimes long-term illnesses. And that includes persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And you know, there are similarities between mental health crises and sometimes those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, particularly when those interactions go sour. Oftentimes, uh, the disabilities um, are manifested by you know, triggers, and we end up with a crisis situation. These differences require different responses from those used on persons in crisis. Now, there's a need to implement policies, procedures, develop effective training, and provide additional services through partnerships to improve the lives of vulnerable populations as well as their families. And when I get further in the prep, uh, presentation, I'm going to show you all some statistics about just how vulnerable this population is. And it's really eye-opening. So what do we want to do today? Uh, we want to express our vision. We want to learn from our past experiences. And we want to realize change. So in doing so, we want to discuss and explain to you, and I'm going to, you know, this is from the San Francisco Police Department perspective. I mean, I know there's a lot going on, 
nationwide in law enforcement, but I'm going to keep this on more in a local perspective when I talk about vision. Um, we really want to be more effective in how we respond to calls involving and encounters involving those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Some of the past experiences that you'll see, we'll, we have a few videos, as I stated, um, and they'll illustrate why we need to change and why we need to realize change in this body of work. And we'll highlight what changes law enforcement in general and the San Francisco Police Department are making to ensure that we treat everyone that we come in contact with with dignity and respect. So in short, our vision is we want to be of help to those who rely on upon us in their time of need. And in doing so, we have to develop a greater understanding of the characteristics and behaviors that persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities may present and the steps to minimize potential safety risks of this vulnerable population during encounters with us. Now, in order to realize that vision, we really have to have a better understanding of those with special needs and then train to it trained to incorporate that understanding into our service delivery. Now, here's a snippet of a San Francisco Police Department training video designed to better understand. And uh, before I even go forward, I, I want to point out in the audience, I have Captain Melinda Moore. And if you were raising hand, Melinda, I just want to give her uh, Just want to give her some kudos because she has uh, poured her heart and soul into really improving us as a department. And what the videos that you're about to see, and I'm going to show you several snippets, but this is the first of several, uh, would not have happened without Melinda's en energy and her commitment to this issue. So thank you, Melinda. John, please play the video. I like shiny objects. I like the reflection of people's glasses, but I'm not trying to invade their safety zone. Do you want to do one more? Is there anything else that applies to you? Number 12. Sometimes people on the spectrum laugh at, an un at unusual times. They just do it. I don't know why. They're not mocking any anyone. OK, well, it says, <clears throat> hi, I'm, are, are you ready now? Um, yes, I am. Okay, it says, hi, I'm Andrew, and I'm on the spectrum. You might notice my voice is kind of loud. That's just the way I am. I'm not being belligerent. Belligerent, right. Uh, but I've already done it. Hi, I'm Jim Ulrey. I have a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. Uh, as people who um, are such are called Aspies and are often weird and so by the transitive property I'm a certified weirdo. What it is I have no facial expression. My name is Papa Lorenzo Melgar. Then I uh, also I am very sensitive to touch. It can be very painful so I might put pull away. I'm not fighting or resisting. Some people on the spectrum might seem a little uncoordinated. That doesn't mean that they're drunk or on drugs. Autistics are usually honest and literal. They're not trying to be rude or sarcastic. I was meditating, actually, in a building, a public building, an empty building on, on the UCSF campus. And I was approached by a security officer there. From behind, I had my earplugs in at the time because I have sensory issues. And I did not hear the, the police officer uh, talking to me. And he thought I was giving him attitude when it, he finally came around in front of me and I saw what was going on. So uh, that was an unintentional miscommunication because of a sensory issue uh, that I was dealing with using earplugs. Uh, I want to say something general, though, also, which is that <clears throat> Uh, I feel that many people on the spectrum, some of them had positive experiences and some negative experiences interacting with the police, but overall, I think we're all aware of how important the police are in keeping our society safe for us. Uh, and this applies especially, I think, to people on the spectrum, that we are very aware what an important role you are playing in keeping the streets generally safe, much safer than they would be without you, so thank you for that.
So, so as you can see, what we're trying to do here is gain understanding and give our officers a better understanding. Now, people like me, I, 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 I'd like to think that I get it. You know, having uh, 22 years of experience as a parent with a child with special needs. But we know that, you know, there are a lot of officers that are out in the field that don't have that experience. And so this type of training, these type of videos, as simple as it might sound, can make a world of difference in how we deal with an encounter when we come in contact with an individual with intellectual or, di or uh, developmental disabilities. You know, most of our actions as police officers are a reflection of our training and our experiences. And it's really essential that we study past incidents to better understand the importance of differentiating between those in a mental or physical health crisis and those with an intellectual disability. And it's, it's really a discernible difference that we have to be better at. Unfortunately, some of the outcomes of law enforcement experience with special needs populations have not been good, and they have been met with really disastrous results. I'm going to show you a video. This, some of you may have seen this, uh, of a gentleman by the name of Ethan Saylor. And just to set the background, um, this happened in January of 2013. Ethan was a 26-year-old uh, young man, and he died, actually, after an encounter with police officers. Ethan had been diagnosed with Down syndrome, and basically that particular evening, he went to the movies and saw the movie that he wanted to see and decided that he wanted to see it again, so he attempted to re-enter the theater. Now, the manager of the theater called the police, and three off-duty Frederick County Sheriff's deputies responded. And now, John, uh, let's roll the video. <coughs> Too many times, people with disabilities come into contact with the criminal justice system and the outcome is anything but just. Misunderstandings and miscommunications lead to cracks in the system. Pathways to justice become impossible to navigate. Ethan, a young man with Down syndrome, was excited to see a movie. When the movie ended, he tried to re-enter the theater because he hoped to see a second showing. Ethan's first contact with the criminal justice system came as a suspect when this was reported as a crime. Three off-duty police officers responded to the theater manager's complaint, and despite requests from Ethan's support staff to wait, things got physical. The exact sequence of events is in dispute, but before the evening ended, Ethan was dead due to asphyxiation when in prone restraint. Ethan fell through the cracks and as a result, lost his life. Things could have turned out differently. Now, as I said, some of these videos are hard to grapple with, but just a few more facts about this video. Um, as an aside, an aide was with Ethan and told officers that Ethan's mother was on her way. The aide further advised the officers that if touched, Ethan would basically freak out. The officers, in response, told the aide to leave the theater and not to interfere. Then the officers grabbed Ethan, which resulted in him cursing at them, Ethan, Ethan cursing at the officers, and the struggle ensued from there. Ethan fell to the ground with the deputy on top of him, and that's when he stopped breathing. We have to learn from these outcomes. We have to learn from these tragedies to get a better response and to prevent subsequent catastrophic failures as this one was. So how do we get better? You know, better discernment, as we call it in law enforcement, situational awareness, knowing what you have in front of you, um, that only comes with training. So to get better in discernment, one of the avenues where the San Francisco Police Department is really focusing on is identifying and being able to distinguish a person in you know, a mental health crisis versus a person with a, dis a disability that's causing this type of response. You know, unlike incidents involving a person in a mental or physical crisis, there have not, there's really not been a concentrated focus on specifically addressing persons with an intellectual developmental disability in law enforcement. And although the current training to respond to persons in crisis is fairly effective, 
we need to recognize that although similar, there's a big difference, a marked difference between persons considered in a mental health or health crisis and those with an intellectual or developmental disability, and that these differences may require a different response. And you know, going back to Ethan's situation, I don't know what training those officers had, and it, it's you know, not fair for me to judge you know them on that. But what I do know is, in those situations, the better training you have, the better understanding you have, the better off you are in terms of dealing with and effectively handling those encounters. As a result of Ethan's incident, the Maryland governor created a commission and developed a statewide training standard for law enforcement in Maryland and first responders to interact with people with disabilities. So how do we distinguish persons in crisis versus developmental disabilities? First, let me start with kind of what the definition of those, a situation with which a person experiences an intense, intensive behavioral or emotional or psychiatric response triggered by a precipitating event. I'm sorry, can't even say the word. Uh, that, that's a health crisis. You know, the person may be at risk of harm to self or others, disoriented or out of touch with reality, functionally compromised and otherwise agitated, unable to be calmed down. If the crisis is left untreated, it can result in a mental health emergency. Now, we come in contact, particularly in the city and county of San Francisco, we come in contact with this situation quite a bit. You know, these incidents can lead, lead to you know, suicide due to depression. Uh, a lot of times they're really aggravated by substance abuse, by untreated psychiatric disorders, PTSD, et cetera. You know, there's a, a large spectrum of, of issues that we come across. But there's really a need to understand that as opposed to a person who's intellectually or developmentally mentally disabled and that disability is what's driving the behavior as opposed to a crisis caused by psychosis from drugs or some other mental health uh, breakdown. It's really important to discern because our response can be the difference as we saw in the last video between life and death. It's that serious for us. The definition of intellectual disability, you know, these disorders are characterized by a limited mental capacity and difficulty with adaptive behaviors. You know, behaviors such as managing money, schedules, routines, social interactions. They generally appear before the age of 18 and may result from physical causes such as autism, cerebral palsy, or from non-physical causes such as a lack of stimulation and adult responsiveness. Developmental disabilities, severe long-term disabilities that can affect cognitive abilities, physical functioning, or both. Now, generally, they appear before the age of 22 and are likely to be lifelong. Here is you know, a tip, and I want to go back to this video that we saw a second ago with Ethan, you know, with the aide. The aide that was there to help, the aide that was there to give information that, had it been listened to, may have prevented that situation from escalating. One of the things that it's sometimes difficult for police officers to do, particularly in the heat of a moment, um, is slow down. Slow down and listen. And, you know, oftentimes we get in a situation where we believe, you know, somebody's life is at risk or safety is at risk, and it's all about stabilizing the situation. But we've learned over time, particularly those of us that have been around for a while, that we have to step back and we really do have to slow things down. And we're going to talk a little bit more in, in the future slides about how, how we are doing that. Getting back to some of the signs and developmental disability, uh, some people may be solely physical, such as blindness from birth. Um, others may involve physical and intellectual disabilities stemming from a genetic, genetic or other causes, such as Down syndrome or fetal alcohol syndrome. Now, there's a, a characteristic that I learned, uh, particularly from you know, my personal experience with our son. When, when he was younger, uh, there were no outward signs that he was disabled. He looked like a normal child. And you know, as soon as you interacted with him, you, you could quickly figure out that that wasn't the case. But there is a population out there, uh, many people that are intellectually and developmentally mentally disabled, where first appearance 
Nobody, you can't tell the difference. That's a much harder population for, particularly for law enforcement officers because you really have to know what you're looking for, number one. You really have to know the cues, number two. Number three, you really have to be trained. If you don't have a personal experience like I do, uh, you really have to understand and know that just because a person looks like a typical individual, uh, they may not be. And that processing has to happen pretty quickly in a volatile situation. This is why we have to train. This is why it's so important to have videos like what Captain Moore put together so our officers have an awareness of what to look for. I'm gonna segue into use of force because oftentimes when we don't know what to look for, those encounters turn into what we don't want and that's physical force having to be used by police officers on a person with a developmental or intellectual disability. Now we know that when many times when police are called to incidents involving a person with an intellectual or developmental disability um, because of a perceived threat or concern due to the oftentimes the disability itself is really difficult to distinguish. Like I said, some people there's no outwardly signs of any type of disability and those are much more difficult to deal with you know for, from a policing perspective and whether this call for service is self-initiated or whether officers are responded, responding to a dispatch call for service our training needs to focus on slowing things down you know there's a saying that i learned early on in, in policing in my career time is on your side if you can slow things down you're going to be better off <clears throat> and that's a learned skill because when you're in the heat of the moment and you roll up on a call and it's chaos, oftentimes you, know, you react based on what your training is, what your experience is, but sometimes you have to kind of collect yourself and you have to slow things down. Um, that is the mode of training that is on the forefront of law enforcement. As simple as it sounds and as basic as it sounds, uh, easier said than done. Slowing things down, create time and distance. Understanding the possibility that a disability may be a contributing factor is key and responding accordingly to the overall situation, not the initial perception, is also key. A little bit statistically speaking about police use of force. Now, the chart that you see in front of you kind of breaks down. Um, research shows that approximately 25 percent, some say as high as 50 percent, a person's killed by police may have a mental disorder or that person was in a mental health crisis, including under the influence of a controlled substance during this encounter. Now, what I believe as a professional, as the chief of police sitting here in front of you, that hidden in those numbers are a lot of people with developmental disabilities. And with over 18,000 police departments across the country and really no national standardization of what has to be tracked and needs to be tracked, we don't really know what that number is, to be quite frank with you. And it's my hope that before I leave this profession um, that we do a better job because with anything, you know, when you have data and research, then you can start figuring out what you need to do to make things better. We just don't have the data on this, on this subject. You know, incidents involving individuals with disabilities and developmental or intellectual, they go under the radar, to be quite frank with you, because we're not, we're not really capturing it. Sorry about that. Let me see, I skipped ahead too far. Give me once. Okay. Here are more statistics. And basically what this graph shows is as the number of calls for service involving persons in crisis increased, law enforcement re-examined re -examined the basic training philosophies and standard operating procedures to adjust our response, the officer's response to incidents involving a person in crisis. And the whole spirit behind that was we want to minimize getting to a situation where we have to use force, oftentimes when force can be prevented if we know what the situation is that we're facing. The San Francisco Police Department in 2015, we really kind of stepped up our game and expanded our effort. 
including our crisis intervention training, to better understand how to deal with persons in crisis. Now, this doesn't specifically speak with the intellectual and developmental disabilities training, but just better training on how to deal with a person in crisis was a, was a good step in the right direction for us because in that, now we are specifically focusing more on the other side of, of it, you know, how much of this is uh, due to developmental or intellectual disabilities. You know, the changes that were included, you know, slowing things down, you're gonna hear me say that over and over again, creating time and distance. If you have to use force, use a proportional amount of force. A amount of force is reasonable. <clears throat> um, increasing our training techniques to reinforce de-escalation. And basically limiting force against people that are only a danger to themselves. Also, we tools of the trade, you know, we have uh, new tools of the trade, extended, ex extended range impact weapons where we don't have to necessarily use lethal force uh, when we do get beyond a situation that could be handled through, through de-escalation or verbal techniques. Um, what can we do short of lethal force? So all these things I think has helped us really reduce our use of force and since 2015, our use of force in San Francisco is down about 27% overall. Um, but again, we have to do better in really calling out the developmental disability issues because we really don't know what that number is, to be quite frank with you. So when an incident involves a person with an intellectual or developmental disability that at times may present characteristics that are considered aggressive, violent, such as with certain types of conditions like Asperger's and you know, the mere presence of a police officer in uniform may trigger an unwanted response. You know, the next video that I'm gonna show you is an incident, and this one is pretty intense as well, of Charles Kinsey. And just to set this up, some of you have seen this. This was July 18th, uh, 2016, and this was in Miami, Florida. Mr. Kinsey was a social worker, and you know, during this incident, he was actually shot by uh, police in North Miami, Florida. He was, Mr. Kinsey was actually deal, you know, dealing with and trying to help a 23-year-old autistic man. And Kinsey had gone to the care facility to locate this man who had been reported missing. A summary of the event shows that officers were dispatched to a report of a person with a gun threatening to shoot himself. Upon arrival, officers attempted to gain compliance, yet the person with the object that was believed to be a gun refused to obey. John, if you would please play the video. That's Mr. Kinsey laying on the ground and the other individual uh, sitting is the person with the developmental and intellectual disability. Like, please don't shoot me. But why they shot the black boy and not the fat boy? You know, because they uh, deal with the blacks, you know. I don't know who's guilty. So, the therapist was on the ground with his hands up. Again, the therapist is there to help. Now, you know, I, I, I will say this, I, I don't want to get into, you know, right or wrong or what happened on that shooting, but what I do know about this is 
slowing things down, listening. You know, the therapist, I think you saw in the video, and it was pointing out that what was in the man's hand was a toy truck, actually. And um, the officers never processed that information, apparently. And they, they, you know, felt that a life was being threatened, and it, it resulted in tragedy. Now, Mr. Kinsey was the one that was ultimately shot by the police, and he survived his injuries. But again, understanding, you know, I don't know that the officers really knew what they had in front of them. And this is why understanding is vitally important for us to not have this happen. Um, is, you know, it's a tragedy and we have to get better. We have to learn from these type of incidents to get, to get better, to be better at what we do. So how do we do that? How do we realize changes? Now, as I, as I talked about, you know, my, when I put on my, my father hat and having a, a child with a developmental and an electoral disability, um, I think about this. I think about it often, you know, I, I what's going to happen? You know, my, I'm not, I can't be there all the time. My wife can't be there all the time. Um, but we can make a difference. We in law enforcement, people like me and Captain Moore and others, many others, we can make a difference to make sure we have the best understanding that if we encounter, that we do the best job we can to try not to have a tragedy occur. And those encounters happen daily. You know, they happen many ways, casual, people asking for directions, uh, public event or just walking down the street, people being a victim or witness of a crime, uh, people being suspects, person of interest. And it's not to say that people with developmental disabilities don't get involved in criminal activity because sometimes that does happen. Um, and that's another side of the story that we have to be better at, really understanding how to deal with that. And person being the subject of an encounter, when that, when that call is dispatched by a bystander that's seeing something that they believe is, you know, criminal activity or suspicious activity. You know, we get dispatched to calls all the time. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the issues concerning that, particularly when it comes to implicit bias. This is a vulnerable population. As I said before, and you can see on the chart before you, the information gathered, this came from the United States Bureau of Justice. It indicates that between 2011 and 2015, the rate of violent victimization against persons with disability was two and one half times higher than it was for persons without disabilities. Persons between the age of 12 and 15 had the highest rate of victimization than any other age group. Uh, it's a vulnerable population, which is why we have to be on top of this. We who come in contact with the victims and the witnesses, we have to be on top of this. In terms of encounters with law enforcement, we also know that persons with intellectual and disabled uh, or uh, intellectual disabilities may be more easily targeted for victimization because they are vulnerable. People can be manipulated. Uh, and they are less likely or able to report victimization because the perpetrator is a friend. Now, that is a big problem. Um, you know, a lot of people, because they do feel isolated or feel like, um, you know, they don't have friends, are really overreaching to find a friend. And sometimes that's taken advantage of. Uh, as a parent, I worry about that all the time. You know, people just want to be feel like anybody else. You know, I want a friend. I want somebody that I can talk to and rely on. And there are people out there that, that prey on that. And it, it's a problem for us, and it's a problem for us in law enforcement. It's a problem for us as parents, because it's something that um, sometimes you, you, you just can't, uh, as much as you talk to your child or as law enforcement, as much as we train, we can't control people who want to prey upon a vulnerable population. So it's something that we have to deal with in law enforcement and as parents. So we're going to go into uh, a little bit about subjects or people that are determined to be persons of interest. Now, this next slide would be probably a little bit surprising to some, some of you, and some of you probably already know this. 
incarceration of Americans with disabilities. Now, this, this also came from uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics. And if you look at the slides, very, very high percentages of people who are incarcerated have disabilities. Um, that is very alarming for many reasons. But it illustrates why it's so important for us police officers to train, to understand, and maybe to turn these numbers in a different direction. But that is a very alarming statistic. Studies show that people with developmental and intellectual disabilities are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. They represent two to three percent of the general population and four to ten percent of incarcerated persons overall. Um, what that means to us is during a normal shift, we're likely to come across somebody with an intellectual or developmental disability. Sometimes we can ferret that out based on our training. Sometimes we can't. So when we're taking uh, or encountering a person with disabilities, intellectual or developmental, into custody, we have to give particular care to the manner in which the person is placed in physical custody if those disabilities are physical. Because if we don't, it can elicit a response that can be unpredictable and quite frankly unwanted. The issue here is that sometimes the person cannot articulate what those disabilities are. And when I talk about slowing down and taking extra time, it's really important for us when we really, at the time we determine that we're dealing with somebody with an intellectual or developmental disability, you really do have to spend extra time. You really do. And, you know, I, my son has some, some developmental uh, malformities. Not so sure that he would be able to articulate that if an officer were to place him in handcuffs, to be quite frank with you. Uh, and if he doesn't, it could be harmful to him. So we know that's an issue. And it, it goes back to the understanding. And, and you're going to see another training video in a second, in a few minutes, rather, um, about recognition and understanding. Because you, we have to spend the extra time to get the information that we need in order for us to do the right job and, and a good job. So that takes communication. It takes patience. And it really takes understanding and being able to recognize what we're looking at. Now, here's another snippet, as I said, of a training video that will help us get better at our encounters with individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities. John, if you could play this one. Uh, you could be high helping them. They could have been missing for days. Uh, they could have just come out of a really dangerous situation, and they're unaware that you're trying to help them. Try not to look like you're, you're corralling them, but do that in a stealth-like way so you can cut off the running route because they want to get back to their, their comfort zone for the moment. And it's momentarily, that's all they're thinking about. Be very careful as first responders. Um, we know that the person uh, affected by autism is either in a combative state, a highly anxious, motiv uh, motivated by seeking their comfort zone. So they are doing everything they can to get away from us and the stimulus. Um, kill the lights in the car, kill the siren, maybe lower the radios, and maybe find the calmest person within your, your responding group to do the talking. Um, loud noises, loud voices, commanding talk is something they're going to shy away from. Um, you'll get better results um, with a calmer voice. Now, as you saw, Officer Padilla has a, he's the father of a child with autism. And like me, you know, many of us, you know, who live this, you have a better understanding. So one thing about this profession, you know, police profession, um, there's no better trainer, if you want to illustrate a point, than another police officer. Because cops tend to listen to other cops. So to have people, yeah, it's true. <laughs> But to have, you know, uh, an officer like Padilla or even, you know, uh, some of the other people in our department, officers in our department, sworn in civilian who, who can really take their life experiences and translate that in a relatable way to training is really, really important. 
Uh, this video was really well received by our, our, our force and these are the type of things that we have to, to continue to do to get better because it's all about understanding. You know, I talked about, you know, caregivers. You know, I perfectly understand that if I'm dealing with a person with disability, sometimes I might not need to be talking to that person. I might need to be talking to the person, the caregiver or the person, the aide who can better articulate, who has a really uh, better understanding of you know, what the disabilities are and can articulate to me what I need to know to do my job. So having officers like Padilla on the, on the police force really are helpful. Having you know, people like Captain Moore really are helpful to get that message across to other officers who don't have those personal experiences. So it's a really, really important piece of training for us and I'm really proud that we're taking the steps to do this. Interviews with suspects or persons of interest. Now, you know, I was uh, in my prior years a homicide detective for a few years. Also, I spent a couple of years uh, investigating gang related, mainly violent crime. One of the things that I saw often was a lot of the people that I came in contact with in my mind, and I'm not a psychologist, but I, I just, I truly believe that there were uh, disabilities present that had never been diagnosed. And the reason that's so important in terms of a, from a, both a legal perspective and as an investigator, you, you really have to get a sense of what you're dealing with because it, if, you, if you don't, you, it can lead to some places that you don't want to go. False confessions, fake confessions. People want to please. A lot of times individuals with disabilities, intellectual and dis uh, developmental, they want to please. And if you, don't, if you don't recognize that, you can get a false confession. So it's really, really important. It's really, really important that that recognition takes place. Um, feeling overwhelmed by police presence, you know, knowing how far to push, not understanding instructions or commands, saying things that they believe police want to hear, you know, all these things can be mitigated with proper training and better understanding. Now, when those encounters are self-initiated um, by the police officer, oftentimes it's because of, you know, what we call, a, you know, a, either a reasonable suspicion or sometimes probable cause that some crime has been committed. And oftentimes, though, the calls are relayed from people in the public to dispatch. Now, we've all seen calls, particularly lately, with people that called in on an individual thinking one thing, and some of them have been a little bit over the top in terms of, uh, you know, what I think to be, you know, implicit biases. And when we respond to these calls, we really have to be able to make our own assessment. And, you know, it, it is important what the caller is seeing and saying and all that, but we have to be prepared and have our officers have the skills needed to both respond safely and to, to be really ferret out, you know, fact from fiction, bias from reality. And in terms of, you know, the special needs population, I think that's even more important because there are a lot of implicit biases when it comes to special needs uh, individuals. Bias by proxy is what I'm talking about. So if I call the police and I see an individual that I think is doing something suspicious or whatever, um, what's shaping my perception? You know, how much have I been trained on this? You know, if I see somebody that has, you know, Down syndromes and they're wobbling and I think they're, you know, either under the influence or mentally impaired or whatever, uh, am I taking the extra time to really understand what it is that I'm seeing before I call dispatch to have an officer? Oftentimes, I will tell you, people don't. They call they, and we get there. So it's really incumbent upon us to be able to filter through all that. And according to the Vera Institute, bias by proxy poses a major challenge to officers responding to calls. And this was a, a 2008 opinion, so it's a, you know, a little over 10 years old. But Dale Larson, who was a professor at the UCLA School of Law, uh, he kind of made it his mission to support expanding federal protections for individuals with the developmental disabilities. 
He felt that implicit bias with people with disabilities is one of the strongest types of implicit bias in our society. Uh, he felt that strongly about it. And it does play a role in how we respond. You know, we respond to what is on the screen in front of us. And oftentimes if that body of information that's on the screen in front of us is driven by implicit bias, it may impact the way we respond to things. So we have to be able to discern is I'll go back to what I said earlier. We as police officers have to be able to discern. And I'm gonna show you this training video that our training staff put together. Again, this is another piece of our training of how we're dealing with this issue. John, if you would play the video, please. John, if you would play. Hi, ma'am, are you the one that called? Yes, I am. What happened? Well, I don't know, that, that guy over there just came into my store and he was walking around really odd and picking things up and putting them down. And I didn't know what he was doing. And then I went over to kind of check and he just turned around and hit me really hard. I mean, he, I guess he bumped into me, but he didn't say, he didn't even seem to be aware of it. He didn't say, excuse me, or he's sorry or anything. He just took the chips he had in his hand and they walked out of the store. Are you hurt at all? No. Do you need an ambulance? No. Okay. Where is he now? He's down there. He's standing down there. That guy with the green, whatever it is, that bag. Hang on right here. We'll come back all and right. talk to you. Hi, sir. Can you get your hands out of your pocket? The woman over here is claiming that you, uh, you hit her. No. She also okay. said you took something from the store. I can even have. All right. How old are you? 20. Okay. What's your name? Hiro. Mm -hmm. okay. What's your last name? Medina. Do you, do you live around here? Not really. Somewhere else in the city. Well, Hero, um, you know, we're just concerned because um, she feels like you bumped into her on purpose. Um, and then you're saying you didn't bump into her on purpose, I guess. But we're just trying to find out, you know, kind of why she might feel like that. Um, yeah, she's thinking you took the bag of chips on purpose. I can give it back. Here, are you diagnosed with anything? Are you taking any medications? I have autism. All right. Three out of 13. Recognition. Of the police I mean. officer is one of the most complicated in society. You're asked to respond to numerous calls on a daily basis and make effective and ethical decisions using your training and experience. Consider the scene we just witnessed. How many calls for service have you responded to which begin almost exactly like this? How much do you really know walking in? Sometimes the most important piece of information is the one you don't have access to. Autism spectrum disorder is extremely common, but it might not always be clear when you're encountering it. You police a large and diverse community. As police officers, you have a duty to treat all members of the community with respect provide trust, be neutral in your encounters, and provide every person a voice. In the next few minutes, we will discuss autism, how this condition manifests itself, and the ways that police officers can safely and effectively serve these members of our community. So again, this is just a portion of the video that we give our officers so they have a better understanding of how to respond, how to, how to, how to, how to encounter. I'm gonna do a public safety announcement plug here. So for those of you that many people in this room um, probably are more educated than the average individual on really understanding what you're seeing in terms of dealing with a person with an intellectual developmental disability. Uh, what I would ask you know, from a public service perspective is 
Uh, as much as, as you have conversations with your friends, neighbors, loved ones, is to have those conversations, you know, help educate because bias by proxy is a problem for us. I, I can tell you that. People call on what they believe is happening and we have to respond to it. And, you know, as much as we train and, and try to provide the tools for our officers to recognize what it is they're dealing with, we still get the calls. Uh, and there is a, a need for educating the general public to take, you know, take the time and try to determine what you got and, and before you make the call. So my ask of the audience is have those conversations. Please continue to have those conversations. Many of you are educators, many of you work in this, in this world. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a message that needs to be spread in terms of implicit bias, taking the time to recognize what you're looking at so you don't make a bad situation worse by your own biases. And that's something that I think uh, as a society we gotta get better at, so. What all this is about for us is we want to prepare our officers to prevent the need to use force, not to react to these type of situations by using force. You know, that training video uh, that Officer Padilla and Officer Bandy um, with the gentleman with, au with autism, those situations often go sideways just because there's no awareness of what is in front of you. There's no awareness that the person is, you know, has, you know, uh, autism or whatever the, the, the issue is. And it, without awareness, you have more probability of things going sideways. So the training is definitely needed and necessary. So, and that's why we do it. We want to prevent these situations from escalating to a point where they get uh, to a situation where force has to be used to get it back under, under control. You know, according to a report by the Police Executive Research Forum, better known as PERF, nearly all the use of force incidents that have proved to be controversial, and this, this study was over a number of years, the officers' actions reflected their training. And that's, that's a true axiom in policing. You know, how you train is how you're gonna react. So the better we train, the better understanding we have, the better reaction you should expect and demand from us. You know, the mindset of policing in general has changed over the last few years, you know, from this, this warrior mentality uh, of, of going in and, and being the, you know, the triumphant warrior to one of a guardian, one that is the caretaker of the community. Um, you know, the San Francisco Police Department, we spent a lot of time over the last year develop, develop a strategy statement and what we came up with, and this was many members of the department that participated, is we want to stand for safety with respect for all, for all. Disabled or not, typical for all. And this is our guiding strategy. We want to stand for safety with respect. In order to do that, we have to train, we have to understand. So part of you know, that strategy includes in just, uh, engaging in just transparent, unbiased, and responsive policing. And again, you know, bias is a big part of this population. There are a lot of biases uh, in terms of how people view people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We want to do so in the spirit of dignity and collaboration with the community. And that's a really important piece. That video would not have been produced. I know I gave uh, Captain Moore uh, Thanks for this, but there are a lot of other people, community partners that made this happen and um, that had a lot more to bring to the table than we did in terms of expertise. So co collaboration and partnership is key in terms of uh, really policing, getting better. And then we want to maintain and build trust and respect as the guardians of constitutional and human rights. And I think that's just very basic, but it's really as simple as that for us. So how are we going to accomplish that? Training. And what you see in front of you, and I'll go through this part quickly, is um, the San Francisco Police Department's level of training compared to national statistics. And I'm proud to say that our training levels are in the orange graphs. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we do a lot more than what's required of us. But we do that because 
we want to be better at what we do, particularly when it comes to this issue. Um, it comes at a cost, though. You know, it, when officers are sitting in training, they're not on, on, in the field. And that's this, this tension that, you know, everybody wants to deal with now. You know, I, I get calls every day about, I want to see more officers in my community. What they don't know is if we don't sit down in the academy and do this type of training, the service that you get is going to be diluted and we could be better. So we want to be responsive, but we also want to be professional and we want to be the best that we can be in terms of handling the calls and the community needs that we need to handle. So training is a very, very important part of that. And as you see, I think we, we really put our money where our mouths are when it comes to that issue. You know, some of our specialized training, autism training, crisis intervention, procedural justice, uh, pr uh, principal policing and implicit bias, managing implicit bias. I just signed a memo last night. We're about to reinstitute another round of implicit bias training. Creative, creating an inclusive environment. Just signed that memo last night as well. Use of force and critical thinking. Critical thinking is really important because, like I said, a lot of times we get thrust into a very volatile situation and um, naturally you react. Some of it is instinctive, particularly when you feel that somebody's life is in danger, particularly your own, you react. And how we react in that situation has to be coordinated. So we just instituted another block of training for our, our troops on critical mindset. You know, making sure that we're coordinated, making sure that we're thinking critically, making sure that we, somebody is there to slow things down. And that is really important, particularly when it comes to this issue, because slowing things down usually yields better results. Our crisis intervention training, I won't go into too much detail on that, but we spend, you know, we have a 40 hour block and a 10 hour block. Our goal is to train the entire police department over the next couple of years. And some of the, the, the key issues there, de-escalation versus escalation, voice neutrality, listening, uh, tonal communication atmospheres, all those things when it comes to particularly, you know, autism and Asperger's, those things matter. They matter greatly. So the better we are at it, the better our response is going to be. Promoting procedural justice, you know, for a short definition, procedural justice really gets to fairness. How are we treating people based on the situation is what we're doing perceived as fair. And there's a whole block of training that goes into that so our officers really understand the core principles and tenets of procedural justice, creating a fair environment for everybody. Rethinking, re-engineering, retraining. You know, it has to be a systematic approach to reducing the frequency of what we saw in these videos from happening. It has to be systematic. It has to be ingrained in the culture and the DNA of our department. And that's what we're trying to do. That's the reason that, you know, these videos and all this training that I'm talking about exists is because how we train becomes our behavior. And we want our behaviors to be consistent with our values. And that goes back to treating people with respect. <laughs> and I want you to keep on talking, but we've got another speaker. Okay. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So I will skip to that one. <laughs>